Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Joe Topat. Stranger Things should have ended after season one. It told a satisfying story about a missing child that also involved monsters and other dimensions. There was no need for a season two because the story ended after Will was found. Don't get me wrong. I was excited to watch season two. But it wasn't anywhere near as good as the first. It was basically the first season without any of the elements that made it work. Plus that one episode that was a terrible attempt at a spin-off series. Season 3 was better than 2, but not as good as 1. My main complaint is the amount of boy bashing or mic bash and Max did, so I wasn't excited for season 4. To be honest, season 4 did some things better than the previous seasons, but it's still nowhere near as good as the first. Many disagree, and that's fine, but I'm here to give my own opinion, and not just say what's popular. This season does suffer from similar problems that plague 2 and 3, namely too many characters and pointless side quests. It now has a new problem, being way too long and dragged out. I'm going to give away spoilers, so you know what to do if you haven't seen this season yet. So without further ado, let's begin. Unlike before, the story takes place in different locations. Eleven and the buyers now live in California. Hopper is in Russia. Brenner and Dr. Owens are in Nevada. And everyone else is in Hawkins. It's pretty hard to keep track of what's going on. And honestly, the only story that matters is what's happening in Hawkins. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to go over each story individually. In California, Eleven is having a hard time fitting in. She has this bully named Angela, who enjoys making her life hell. We've seen Troy bully Mike and his friends in Season 1. While Troy behaves like a typical 80s movie bully, he still felt like a real bully. Angela, for the most part, felt like a real bully, but she did go over the top. I'll get to that later. In her letters to Mike, Eleven makes it out that her life is great, even though it isn't. In other words, she's lying to him. Remember how in Season 3, Eleven dumped Mike for telling her one lie he was forced to make? Remember how Mike felt bad about lying to her? And how he later admitted that he lied? Well, Eleven has been lying to him for months without feeling the least bit guilty. She wouldn't even admit to Will that she's lying to her boyfriend. Mike at least admitted to Lucas that he lied to Elle. This show has turned her into the world's biggest hypocrite. When Mike shows up to California, he's excited to meet Eleven's new friend Angela. That's right. She told her boyfriend that her bully is her best friend. Why? Because she's an idiot. Unfortunately, Angela shows up at the skating rink Mike Eleven and Will are hanging out at. She decides to get back at Eleven for snitching on her to the teacher. Even though Eleven didn't, and Angela saw that she didn't. Why does Angela think she snitched? Because she's an idiot. I admit that Angela's behavior at school did felt like something a real bully would do. Her bullying Eleven while she's making a presentation was kind of a stretch, but I'm willing to let it slide. It's at the skating rink that she came off as over the top. 
You see, she was somehow able to put together an elaborate prank that involved multiple people skating around 11, a guy with a camcorder, the DJ being in on it, and a guy dumping a milkshake on 11. Even if I was able to believe that Angela could get away with such a big prank in public, there was no way she could have put all this together moments after learning that Eleven's there. I know this is taken from Carrie, but the bully's prank worked because they had a lot of time to plan and set it up. Here, Angela had like five minutes to set everything up. Personally, I thought she was going to come on to Mike. Maybe try to kiss him in front of Eleven. That would have made way more sense. A lot of people criticize Mike and Will for not trying to stop the bullying. I think these people are being unfair. Will isn't a confrontational guy. Even if he was, what the hell could he have done to stop it? As for Mike, he had just learned his girlfriend had been lying to him. It took him a moment to process what's happening. He's not a very good skater, so skating out to stop them is out of the question. So he goes to the DJ, who's a lot closer, to get him to stop the music. When the milkshake was dumped on Eleven, Mike tried to go to her, but she didn't want to face him. I can't say I felt sorry for Eleven after all the crap she pulled last season without apologizing, and the fact that she is doing the exact same thing she dumped Mike over. She even wanted Angela, her bully, to lie to him. Am I the only one who's upset that Eleven is a big hypocrite? Anyway, Angela makes a nasty comment about Not-So-Dead Hopper, and Eleven smashes a skate in her face. The police don't question her right then and there, because of plot convenience. Jonathan, who for some reason's now a stoner, and his friend, whose name I don't care to remember, makes light of the situation. Nobody bothers telling Joyce what Eleven just did, because of plot convenience. A lot of people think Mike was being a hypocrite for getting mad at Eleven for attacking Angela when he was okay with her attacking Troy in the first season. This is what is known as comparing apples to oranges. In season one, Troy attempted to beat up Mike. So Eleven made him pee his pants. She didn't physically hurt him, just embarrassed him. Later, Troy held a knife to Dustin and forced Mike to jump to his death. Troy was left explaining to the police that a girl with powers broke his arm. They didn't believe a word he said. Angela just pulled a nasty prank and made a rude comment. There's a difference between breaking the arm of a guy who's trying to kill your friends and smashing a skate into a girl's face over a prank in a comment in front of witnesses. The police have no reason to believe the former, but every reason to believe the latter. Plus, aren't we forgetting that Eleven's the real hypocrite for lying to her boyfriend? Mike tries to console Eleven, but she shuts him out, thinking that the guy whose bully tried to murder him doesn't understand what she's going through. She also accuses him of thinking she's a monster, all because he was mad at her for committing assault. She even believes that Mike doesn't love her anymore because all of his letters are signed from Mike, 
rather than love Mike. Um, excuse me, he's done way more for you than most boyfriends would. I hate to be the dead horse, but you're the one who's been lying to him for months. Were you lying to him whenever you signed your letters, Love L? Mike tries to reassure Levin, proving what a sweet guy he is. Then the police show up to arrest her. My, how convenient it was that they decided to do something the moment Joyce left. Anyway, Dr. Owens bails out Eleven and promises to wipe out her arrest record. He tells her that her friends in Hawkins are in trouble and he has a way to get her powers back. Why he didn't do this after she lost her powers? Who knows? I do like how Dr. Owens made it Eleven's choice whether or not she wanted her powers back. Eleven chooses to go with Dr. Owens without discussing it with her stepbrothers and boyfriend. I guess she doesn't give a shit about what they have to say. Some military people want Eleven dead, so it's up to Mike, Will, Jonathan, and that pizza dude to go warn her. It would have been nice if she had discussed what she was going to do with them first. That way, they would have known where to go to warn her. The road trip is the most boring part of the season, and not much happens. It felt like the writers found these characters unimportant, which is a shame because I like Mike, Will, and Jonathan. Well, I mostly like Mike. He's my personal favorite. The Russian escape was rather pointless. It felt more like a prison movie than Stranger Things. As much as I like Harper, I feel like he has no real purpose on the show anymore. Keeping him alive also cheapens his death. I would have preferred Joyce go with Mike and her sons to warn Eleven. Eleven is supposed to be her adopted daughter, and yet I never got the feeling that they are close. Season 1 you got an instant connection between the two, but here it's non-existent. And Joyce is supposed to be raising her. Now for Eleven getting her powers back. When she lost them last season, I thought it was because she overused them. She just needed time to recharge. I assumed that they would slowly come back over time maybe show up when she least expected. I also thought that Mike and the Byers might even play a role in helping Eleven get her powers back. Instead, the Duffers gave a convoluted way for her to get her powers back. Dr. Brenner is still alive. It's never explained how he survived an attack from a Demogorgon or why he's waited until now to get to Eleven. He has her drugged, dressed in a hospital gown, and her head shaved. Why was shaving her head again necessary? I guess Brenna likes buzz cuts. On a side note, it's a little weird that Owens happens to trust Brenna. Also, why wouldn't he tell Eleven that Brenna would be involved? That seems like something she should know before agreeing to this plan. Anyway, Eleven is placed in a sensory deprivation tank and forced to remember things she's forgotten from the lab. You see, the reason why she lost her powers is because she was attacked, I guess. And the only way to recover them is to remember things she's forgotten from the lab. How is this supposed to help? I don't know. This is the dumbest thing I ever heard. To make a long story short, Eleven was bullied by the other numbers at the lab 
became friends with a worker who turns out to be one, or a Vecna, or whatever the hell you want to call him. He uses her to get a chip removed from his neck, and he kills all the other numbers in the lab. As he's about to kill Eleven, she somehow remembers her own birth, and her mom saying, I love you. This gives her the power to open the gate and send one to the upside down. <sighs> this is the most contrived bullshit this show has ever done. How the hell was Eleven able to remember her own birth? Even if I was able to ignore the fact that it's biologically impossible to remember your own birth, Eleven's powers don't work like that. Even if they did, when would Eleven's mom had been able to say that? I thought Eleven was taken right after she was born. I know this is supposed to be a sweet moment, but since it relies on her having an ability that was never mentioned before, it comes off as cheap. Anyway, Eleven now has the power to send one to the upside down, thus creating Vecna. The power proved too much for her. She loses her memory as well as her newfound ability and her ability to talk like a normal person. My, how convenient. In season one, it looked like Eleven had never interacted with anyone her own age until she met the boys. I thought the reason why she could barely speak and had limited knowledge is because the lab only valued her powers. Keeping her ignorant meant that she was easier to control. Now the reason why she could barely speak and had limited knowledge is because of some contrived bullshit. I never understood everyone's desire to learn more about Eleven's time in the lab. The first season gave us everything we needed to know. She was kidnapped and abused for her powers. What more did we need to know? Eleven's story felt less about her and more about explaining who one is. She eventually reunites with Mike and the others. Brenda is shot, but I don't know if he's truly dead with the way this show is. Eleven, <sighs> once again, never apologizes to Mike, but she is happy to see him. Mike even gets to save her life by telling her that he loves her. This felt more natural than remembering her own birth, since we know Eleven can hear the real world when she's in the void. I saved the best for last. The story in Hawkins. I knew the move at the end of season 3 was a mistake, for the only time I felt interested was when the show focused on Hawkins. There's a new character named Eddie who's obsessed with D&D. &D. He's wanted for murders he didn't commit and is on the run. One of the victims is the girlfriend of Jason, a popular jock who's actually a pretty decent guy. Jason gets caught up in his own grief. So he and his friends decide to hunt down Eddie and they blame D&D &D for promoting Satanism. I love the fact that he was a good guy before his girlfriend's death. It was actually kind of sad that he fell from grace. Lucas is given some good character development. He's now a jock, but he's torn between his old friends and his new friends. His fight with Jason is the highlight of the season. Max is a lot better than she was last season. She's dealing with grief over Billy's death. Her relationship with Lucas is explored more, and she actually seems to care about him. Max even gets crippled, blinded, and placed in a coma at the end of the season. I didn't think the Duffers would have done that. 
Dustin and Steve are good as usual. Eric is given very little screen time, thank goodness. And the mystery kept me interested. I really love this story, but it's not without its flaws. Robin seems to have lost some IQ points this season, and she feels the need to talk on and on and on and on and on. The show also really emphasizes her sexuality. When Erica was given more to do, the story started to feel like a pain to get through. I wish there was more to her character than being a smart aleck. The writers brought back that love triangle between Steve, Nancy, and Jonathan, which felt redundant. The jokes also tended to be hit or miss, though not as bad as last season. Whenever I started to like Max, the show would feature clips from season 3 that reminded me why I don't like her. I also thought it was a little weird that a lot of time was placed on her grieving over Billy when Billy was an abusive asshole. Because he was such an abusive asshole in the previous seasons, I found it hard to care about Max's grief. I get that he's a stepbrother, but it wasn't like they was just starting to have a good relationship at the time of his death. I also felt apathetic when Max met her fate, because honestly, the past two seasons the writing for her had always been up and down. One minute she wants nothing to do with the boys, the next minute she wants to be their friend. One minute she's okay with Mike and Eleven's relationship, the next minute she isn't. Half the time it felt like plot convenience. As a result, I never felt a connection to her. Of the main six, she was always my least favorite. A minor point, but I thought it was weird that Max needed to listen to her favorite song to keep Vecna away. Couldn't it have been any song she happens to like? Also, I thought running up the hill was okay. I just prefer should I stay or should I go. The biggest complaint I have is the fact that D&D &D was such a huge focus this season. Yet they don't have Mike, Lucas, Dustin, and Will together. As much as I liked Eddie, I would have gladly deleted his character just to have the main four together. It's kind of sad that Stranger Things doesn't care about the friendship between Mike, Lucas, Dustin, and Will. It was the driving force in season one, and one of the reasons why I fell in love with the show. Now it's practically non-existent. I would have also liked to have seen Eleven trying to deal with the monster without her powers. It really would have tested her self-worth. What if one of her friends got hurt and there was nothing she could have done to stop it? Maybe she could have learned something about herself. Maybe she has qualities beyond her powers that she didn't realize she has. Of course I wanted her to regain her powers. It's just that I would have preferred that she regained them in a way that didn't involve a trip down memory lane. I'm convinced that we'll never get a season as good as the first. There was just something special about it that none of the following seasons could top. I know a lot of people love season 4, and I'm happy that they do. I mean it. It's just that I couldn't really get into it the way I did with the first. The writing and the characters were just so much better. It was easy to fall in love with them. Now, it's kind of difficult. Ironically, Stranger Things felt more mature when the main characters were kids. Now that they're older, it feels more childish. I'll always love the first season. To me, that's where the show ends. Thanks for watching. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think. And don't forget to like and subscribe. 
See you later.